Good afternoon and welcome to today's Baker Institute Civic Scientist Lecture titled International Scientific Collaboration Critical Tasks for the Biden Administration. Thank you so much for joining us today online. My name is Kenny Evans and I'm a scholar here at the Baker Institute in Science and Technology Policy and I'll be moderating today's event. <laughs> My lights went off, excuse me. Um, before I start, I would like to take a moment to thank the supporters of the Baker Institute Science and Technology Policy Program who make it possible for us to conduct our research as well as events like this one. Let's see if I can get some light in here. Um, funding for our Civic Scientist Lecture Series, including today's event, was generously provided by a gift by Winifer and Benifer Chang, as well as sponsorship from Rice University's Weiss School of Natural Sciences and the Brown School of Engineering. In addition, our webinars were funded through grants from the Kavli Foundation and the National Science Foundation. And finally, I would really like to thank uh, the Baker Institute staff, especially Macy Stort and Daniel Morale for their support in organizing today's event. Um, let me see if I can turn my lights, it looks a little spooky. Okay. I apologize for that. Okay, our panelists today are Dr. Artie Bienenstock and Dr. Fumi Olapade. They will be discussing why international partnerships are so critical for US science research, how we can encourage, other, uh, encourage international scientific cooperation and be a better partner to other nations, and policy measures the Biden administration can take to strengthen US international collaborative research programs uh, immediately and uh, also in the future. Our first speaker is Dr. Artie Bienenstock. Dr. Bienenstock is the Professor Emeritus of Photon Science at Stanford U University. He's also the Special Assistant to the President for Federal Research Policy at Stanford, as well as Associate Director of the Wallenberg Research Link. Dr. Bienenstock also serves on the National Science Board, uh, currently the, the governing body of the National Science Foundation. Our second speaker will be Dr. Fumi Olapade. She is the Walter L. Palmer Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine and Human Genetics at the University of Chicago. She is the Dean for Global Health and Director at the Center for Clinical Cancer Genetics and the Director of the Center for Global Health also at the University of Chicago. As you mentioned, Dr. Bienenstock and Dr. Olapade are both members of the American Academy of Science and uh, are on, the, on the, the Academy's Committee for Challenges for International Scientific Partnerships, which recently released its first report. Dr. Bienenstock co-chairs this committee and also co-chairs its working group on large-scale science. And Dr. Olapade is a co-chair of its working group on emerging scientific partners. Uh, we will put a link to their report in the chat. Dr. Bienenstock and Dr. Olapati, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so before we start, Dr. Bienenstock uh, will we'll give his remarks, but I wanna remind everyone if they have questions that come up uh, through the chat, they're free to use the Q&A box. Um, and I will, I will get to as many of them as I can throughout the discussion. Uh, so first we'll hear about 10, 15 minutes um, from Dr. Bienenstock, and then we'll turn to Dr. Olapati for, for her remarks. So with that, uh, I know Dr. Bienenstock has some slides prepared, so I will turn the floor over to him. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences Initiative Challenges for International Scientific Partnerships. Um, Whoops. Um, that, that initiative will yield three reports, the first of which has been published already, and it deals generally with the value and importance of international scientific partnerships, as uh, well as a special section on interactions with China. That will form the basis of most of what I say today. The second report will be on US participation in large scale international projects, while the third will deal with uh, emerging scientific partners. And I think Fumi Olapati will have a bit to say about that. I just want to turn off one thing. 
Okay. Um, the scientific scene has changed quite a bit since uh, I started my scientific career back in the 1960s. Then the U.S. really dominated in the world in scientific expenditures. That's no longer the case. Um, the U.S. now accounts for about a fourth of the global total of R&D expenditures. And as you can see on this graph, we still were ahead in 2017. By now, China is essentially equal to us in expenditures, and the EU is not far behind. And there are several other nations with appreciable R&D expenditures. As a consequence of that, our scientists have recognized that there are outstanding scientists around the world with whom they can collaborate. And in 2018, uh, approximately 40% of all US science and engineering articles with, were co-authored with people from other countries. The country with which we have the most collaborations and the co most co-authorships is China. And you, this slide illustrates the remarkable increase in collaborations over the past couple of decades with about 56,000 papers co-authored by US and Chinese researchers. That represents about 10% of all US uh, publications in these fields. A good question to ask is, why are there so many US-China collaborations in spite of the logistic difficulties? Scientists are separated by different time zones, by thousands of miles physically, and yet they choose to collaborate on a grand scale. It's even more remarkable when you recognize how keen the competition is for US government funding only about 10 to 15% of the proposals sent to the NSF or the NIH are funded. If scientists are be, to be renewed or get new grants, they must do the best work possible. They perceive that collaboration with outstanding Chinese researchers makes that possible. And citation indexes as a proxy for quality indicate that on average, international collaborations get many more citations than do domestic collaborations, which in turn get more citations than collaborations within a single institution and so on. Uh, so at least citations indicate that this is the way to go for uh, the highest quality. The Chinese researchers are perceived to have special materials, special capabilities, and uh, special information that our scientists want. Our scientists need, as, as does our government, to remain current on major Chinese scientific advances. We don't want to get caught again with a Sputnik-like surprise. We, we dove a bit deeper and asked a, a, a highly esteemed Stanford researcher, a materials physicist, why he collaborates so much with China. And what he said is that the Chinese provide scientifically important materials that he just cannot obtain domestically as well as the recipes for making them. He said that US academia rewards new materials, but not incremental materials improvements, whereas China has large numbers of scientists that can focus on perfecting a new material. And it is those perfected materials that are most important to study and ultimately to use uh, in the industries of the future. 
His view is confirmed by a uh, uh, National Academy Decatur report on materials physicists, and it was also confirmed by discussions with other materials physicists. One of our colleagues in this study, Caroline Wagner, did a study of US-China collaboration in the early days of COVID-19 research. She points out, or they point out, that uh, scientists rapidly reorganized to focus on COVID-19. And I think we all saw our uh, colleagues in the biomedical area switching to COVID-19 research switching away from what they were doing previously. What they point out, however, is that the re research relationship between China and the United States was strengthened. And now I'll read a quote of one of their final conclusions. These findings are in contrast to some popular accounts that Chinese scientists are withholding valuable information and reducing cooperation in the early stages of the global pandemic. My co-chair of this study, Peter Michelson, pointed me to two papers just recently published from China. One came out at the end of January, 2020, the second, and that was all with three Chinese authors. A second paper came out early in February with Chinese co-authors with people from the Great Britain and Sweden. Both papers pointed out the dangers of a pandemic resulting from the virus that had emerged from Wuhan. There was no hiding of the dangers as early as late January or early February 2020. So what are our conclusions? with respect to collaboration with China. Um, in general, international research collaborations, including with China, are very important for US science and technology. <coughs> in viewing those collaborations, we believe that National Security Decision Directive 189 should be adhered to strictly. What that directive says is that there should be no restrictions on fundamental research that is openly publishable, including restrictions on collaborations. I think most of my, the audience today knows that openness is critically important in university research, in the training of young scientists and attracting graduate students from other countries. The directive says that if restrictions are necessary, the research should be classified. Not sensitive, but unclassified, but classification. And there's good reason for that. It's the laboratories that are experienced with doing classified research and the people who are vetted to do that research who can keep secrets. Universities are bad places for keeping secrets. We think that classification should be reserved for research directly linked to national security, but the, that the universities should ensure strict adherence to their conflict of interest and conflict of commitment policies. Finally, we think it's time that US and Chinese scientific leaders sought agreement on norms and standard practices in the conduct of Chinese-US fundamental research collaborations. Now let me turn to uh, uh, the STEM worker shortage. That worker shortage uh, was something that concerned Neil Lane and me when the two of us were back uh, at OSTP in the last few years of the Clinton administration. And it remains a serious issue for the United States. Uh, one study showed that there were 16 STEM jobs posted for each unemployed STEM worker in 2016. U.S. news echoed the concerns about the crisis. And even the annual report of the State of the Department of Energy National Labs in 2017 
pointed out that the laboratories face several ongoing challenges maintaining critical skills as the laboratory's workforce ages. I looked on the web to see if that's still the case. I went to Lawrence Livermore's uh, listing of jobs open and that list is enormous and important. The gap is very real. Where do we get help filling that gap? When you look at graduate students pursuing doctoral or master's degrees in uh, US universities, you find that a majority of those graduate students in computer and information sciences, in mathematics and statistics, and in engineering are temporary visa holders. Similarly, over 40% of the physical science graduate students are temporary visa holders. Those are important fields for our industries of the future. Where do those students come from? By far, the largest number come from China. Um, India, here's China. India is less than half, and then South Korea, Taiwan, and other countries follow. China is a major source of our graduate students in these critical fields. And they stay. Uh, this graph shows that about 80% of the Chinese graduate students getting doctoral degrees uh, remain in the United States. It's over that for India and others are not too far behind. Uh, we gain enormously from the training of those graduate students who then contribute to our STEM workforce. They play major roles. Uh, as you can see, Silicon Valley Index indicated that about two thirds of all new tech talent in the 25 to 44 age group was Asian. Another older study found that 52% of new Silicon Valley companies in the decade leading up to 2005 were immigrants. And I've noticed that many of the most creative and effective people on Stanford University's faculty and the National Science Board were born in India or China. What about the future though? This past fall, uh, foreign graduate enrollments declined by 40%. Presumably the pandemic was a major cause of that. But our, in our interviews, particularly with Chinese graduate students, we found the one year visa is making life extremely difficult for them. They can't go home for their own weddings, for other weddings, for uh, funerals and the like because they fear there'll be an enormous delay before they can return to the US for their graduate studies. News of that gets back to prospective Chinese graduate students. Similarly, the FBI China Initiative, the Department of Energy Barriers to Chinese Students Using Its synchrotron facilities and neutron facilities and the like, as well as public statements by US leaders discourage students from coming to the States. In the meantime, China and India are building up their graduate programs, making it attractive for students to stay. What's more, China is aging and it's going to need its young people the ratio of workers to retires is declining markedly in China. Knowing that government, which thinks far ahead, they are likely to increase the attractiveness of their young people remaining at home and discourage graduate studies abroad. My point here is that the US cannot rely on Chinese and Indian graduate students indefinitely. So what are our conclusions about the STEM workforce? The US has to be proactive in making the US attractive to foreign students. 
It has to consider the risks and benefits of educating Chinese graduate students, noting that 80% of them stay in the US and make important contributions both to academia, to the government labs, and to industry. <coughs> it should also take account the extremely small number of documented inappropriate actions by graduate students compared to the approximately 80,000 Chinese graduate students in the US. I know of fewer than 10 uh, prosecutions of graduate students. We should return to the five-year visas uh, that were uh, act active in the Obama administration. It's vital that we speed up the visa acquisition process and in particular, buttress our visa vetting staff so we attract the people we want while keeping out the people we don't want. And we should reduce all those actions that discourage Chinese students from coming. At the same time, it's vital that we increase the domestic participation in STEM. And rarely discussed is what a major barrier student debt is to domestic students doing graduate STEM studies. I believe that we have to markedly increase the size of Pell Grants. Uh, President Biden has talked of doubling them. I think they should be tripled, but I'd love to see them doubled. And perhaps we need a new NDEA-like program. Finally, we should actively encourage students from the global south as they will have a large fraction of young people in the coming years. Uh, that's part of the motivation for the third report that I talked about. And I suspect Fumi will talk more about that. Let me close by just listing all the groups that made such important contributions uh, to these studies. Thank you. And Fumi, I turn it over to you. For me? Yes, I said, ah, if, yes, I'm here. So if you would uh, unshare your screen, I'm happy to uh, share my screen. So I really want to thank uh, the Baker Institute for inviting us um, to speak. And um, you've heard from my colleague. I was really uh, uh, delighted when I was asked to uh, co-chair the um, uh, this uh, uh, committee at, at the American Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences. Uh, just by background to um, really introduce myself to the group, uh, I serve as a professor of uh, medicine at the uh, University of Chicago. And as a member of the academy, I was uh, really intrigued by uh, the challenge that we were asked to uh, think about, which is uh, how to make uh, U.S. Uh, uh, a better collaborator in international partnerships. Uh, but because I work at the University of Chicago and my work has been on genetics and uh, I have a really good understanding of some of the challenges in health, uh, I was really uh, delighted to work with my colleagues um, who are uh, thinking about large scale facilities, uh, while I was really thinking about small problems of ensuring that we have equity in uh, how we allocate resources and we do uh, partners, partnerships with um, emerging science partners. Uh, the project was very well received because uh, we were able to do convening across um, uh, different regions of the world. We met with a number of uh, really amazing scientists that are working uh, in the most, uh, uh, what I would call neglected parts of the world. And yet they were looking up to the US for uh, American uh, leadership. Uh, just as uh, Artie had uh, said with the 
uh, his report and especially uh, our emphasis uh, during the pandemic became really to see how we could really have solidarity with scientists all over the world. And everywhere we went, people were talking about, yes, we, you know, we had uh, the US that was really uh, blaming China, but uh, the amount of collaboration that was going on in everybody's lives with uh, 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 scientists all over the world was really, truly amazing. So while we could not convene physically, uh, the first um, convening we went uh, to with an emerging science partner was with Ghana. And then after that, we couldn't do that, but we did do a lot of convening uh, uh, virtually. And we came up with a uh, set of uh, recommendations that I hope after this pandemic, we can um, uh, turn into policy. So let me uh, tell you sort of why my perspective uh, sort of became uh, really uh, 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 changed uh, because as an uh, oncologist, I look at um, some of the challenges that we have a, in a global population of 7.5 billion. And, uh, and when we think about the challenges, especially in my area of work where we have uh, 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 women in the global South dying prematurely from breast and cervical cancer. And when we know uh, uh, the gains that we have uh, been able to realize as a result of scientific advances, I actually think that you know, the renewed emphasis on cancer moonshot uh, with the Biden administration really saying, why can't we defeat cancer? And my answer is because we've been very reductionist in the way we've approached cancer and that we need to think about how we get talent from any, everywhere in the world to work on the problem. That's how we were able to clone the human genome uh, where we had scientists working all over the world 24 seven to uh, assemble the first uh, genome and then since that was identified, we realized that we actually don't have just one genome. We have multiple genomes. We have multiple problems. And there's geographic variation in who gets cancer and who survives cancer. So this is an example of what are the top uh, cancer priorities? Because as we uh, did the convening, people were asking, well, how can the U.S. be uh, uh, better international partners? Well, maybe the U.S. will stop dictating the kinds of research we did. And so we heard a lot from our emerging science partners about should we really be engaging in research to feed what we needed or should we be looking at the priorities of those uh, countries in terms of how research was funded and how research uh, was sustained. So if you um, really uh, think about, uh, uh, you know, if you wanted to cure uh, lung cancer, uh, what are, why are women in, in the U.S. dying now more from lung cancer than they were dying from breast cancer previously? And why is it that um, we, uh, what is it about some of the uh, precision medicine and sort of uh, 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 pharmaceutical uh, developments, in, in, including immunotherapy that, uh, you know, biotech companies are developing in China, across Asia, uh, how do we get those uh, um, uh, drugs to the market if in fact everything has to go through the US FDA? So we heard a lot of things about how we can uh, really foster collaborations and begin to think about public-private partnerships because all these emerging countries, they have defined the burden of diseases in their own countries and they're just looking for the opportunity to participate in entrepreneurship, to participate in a science park and to be part of a solution. So I use this map to think about what are the problems and how we, do we actually uh, uh, engage our international partners. So that's really uh, was the view that I had uh, from my own work. But then uh, the example of you know, a sustainable international partnership that I really wanted to uh, share with you is sort of how I became so fascinated by the uh, uh, transatlantic slave trade and the impact of what the um, uh, slave trade, uh, the impact the slave trade had on the uh, uh, on the uh, genetic uh, architecture and the genetic landscape of African 
uh, Americans in this country. So during the pandemic, everyone was talking about how black and brown people were dying uh, from COVID and the distrust of the medical establishment and also the distrust of vaccines. A lot of reasons for black and brown patients to distrust the biomedical research enterprise. Number one, you know, they haven't benefited from it. And number two, the mistreatment of uh, slaves really has led to significant disruptions in uh, how we understand who is black and who is brown. So for my work, uh, we look at uh, the global South and we look at the fact that um, a, a majority of uh, African-Americans actually uh, came from uh, the West Coast of Africa. But that even when you talk about Africa, it's such a huge continent. It's a young continent and it's a continent that's gonna be growing and will have so many uh, uh, challenges in terms of health challenges that we can use science and technology to deploy, uh, to, to, to solve. And so our uh, artist team were thinking about, you know, where should the, uh, the next um, large scale facility be? And uh, where should we get, you know, and I, when I, I went to the um, convening in, in Ghana, we were also gonna do the Einstein Forum, Forum in Kenya, but that had to be canceled. Uh, everything I heard was that there are all these young people who want to participate in this uh, technology uh, revolution that was coming across Africa. They were asking for uh, the possibility of having uh, large scale science someplace in, in Ghana or across uh, different uh, African countries. So um, it was really uh, exciting to hear what they feel that they could contribute to uh, uh, the, uh, 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 as a, a emerging science partner and then how that can in fact, in fact come back to help us with the diverse communities that are in the uh, United States. So we heard that over and over again. And my work of course is asking why do black women have the highest death rate from breast cancer and remain understudied? So that's the kind of uh, uh, um, you know, questions that we, I was asking and then which got me to go uh, from the US to go to Nigeria where I went to medical school. And we heard over and over again that instead of talking about brain drain where uh, uh, individuals from low resource settings have now been, you know, uh, uh, because of the uh, favorable uh, uh, um, scientific environment are now living in Europe and in the US. And we heard that in fact, what we need to have as policy is a way for uh, 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 folks in the diaspora who want to have what we call brain circulation. So it's not brain drain, but we can be better partners by seeing them as real partners and then allowing um, uh, 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 individuals to be able to engage with uh, scientists back in their home country. So my example is I, I go back to Nigeria and I do work there because I wanted to know uh, whether you know, tumors from different ancestral populations have similar genomic uh, properties. And the only way I could do that work is by engaging with uh, our, our partners in Nigeria. In any case, so the example is my husband and I, he's a, he, he studies asthma, I study breast cancer. And then we went back, uh, this uh, professor Ojengbede was my uh, ob Gaini professor in medical school and uh, professor uh, Baba Lola was a, 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 a professor of clinical pharmacology. And uh, because we had maintained the relationship, we uh, wrote a grant together because when we got there to study our diseases, uh, there were no facilities to actually do the genomics research we wanted to do. And we had to do community engagement. So by asking them what they wanted, they said, well, help us build a, 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 a research to do interdisciplinary collaborations. What they wanted was not just, um, you know, the same old, they wanted innovative data-informed research with the potential to influence the practice of evidence-based patient-focused care of individuals with chronic non-communicable diseases across the lifespan in Nigeria and other African countries. And what they wanted was to be able to develop leadership. And since we started the partnership, 
Not only did uh, Professor Babalola become a member of the African Academy of Science, she became a vice chancellor and Professor Jembede did, uh, uh, runs a center for population and reproductive health. And we can see by really investing in this uh, uh, grant to build leadership, to build networks, and that with uh, in infrastructure to conduct clinical trials, support new clinical researchers, that they were gonna be able to create a leadership model uh, for um, translational research in Africa. And uh, this work has continued to, uh, to be you know, led by this team. They came to the University of Chicago to uh, participate in a big ideas conference and uh, really engage with faculty members at the University of Chicago because they really were bringing their own uh, questions to us and we were uh, uh, collaborating. Anyway, one of the outcomes of the research was that, you know, uh, my husband was studying asthma and, uh, and we took samples from individuals of African ancestry. And lo and behold, uh, after sequencing this 910 individuals, the, we uncovered that the African pan genome contains 10% more DNA than the current human reference genome. So you can imagine how that uh, 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 international partnership allowed us to reveal what we didn't know before. And, uh, and I remember when my uh, colleague Stephen called me and said, well, the samples you got us from, do they have malaria? I said, oh yes, malaria is endemic. Well, what other sequences do they have? Because we can match uh, about 10% of what we have sequenced to the reference genome. And of course, with further alignment, we realized that in fact, this is uh, uh, in, indeed the case. My last uh, example is, uh, is the, the fact that, uh, you know, we've been, you know, collaborating with Mary Claire King to look at BRCA1 and 2 mutation across the African diaspora. And uh, after Myriad's patent was overturned, then it became easier for people to actually participate in that research. So one of the things that we heard uh, from our, our collaborators was the whole idea around patent. Who owns the patent? Who, you know, can you patent a gene, which is really a natural substance? Because all these patenting rules prevent the uh, emerging science partners from being able to participate. And I was saying that, you know, for more than 20 years, we couldn't do the research that we wanted to do in Nigeria, Brazil, Cameroon, and Uganda, because we didn't have enough money to actually sequence uh, BRCA1 and 2 in a lot of African populations. And by after this patent was overturned, we were able to do the work. And now, you know, I used to have Angelina Jolie as my example of a celebrity who had, you know, a BRCA mutation. Now, of course, I have uh, um, uh, Matthew uh, Knowles who shared her in an emotional video that he had BR, you know, breast cancer and he had BRCA2 mutation. So this work was actually done across the diaspora and we published first on African and African-American families. And now it's really become the case that it has implications for young onset breast cancer in African-Americans. So that's really some of the ideas that's coming out of our work uh, in terms of precision healthcare, comprehensive risk assessment, and accelerating precision oncology care. And none of this work would have been possible if we hadn't really developed the capacity of our, uh, uh, of our collaborators to do the work and then help them now with how to do the analysis. So one of the things I had to do with my colleagues at Argonne National Lab was to move all the data back to Nigeria because now the African um, uh, uh, um, Center of Excellence now have capable Nigerians who now have supercomputers who now want to do their own data analysis. And we can, of course, use Globus Genomics to transfer the data back to them. And this summer, we're gonna be having teams of researchers in Nigeria and here analyzing uh, the, the, the data. So I think that, um, one of the, to, to summarize, uh, what I think we have to think about is, you know, what are gonna be our policy priorities for supporting international collaboration? Uh, I think we're gonna think about identifying and supporting excellent science with established and emerging science partners alike. 
Uh, we need to develop well-defined project scope and project management in cases of large-scale initiatives. Uh, U.S. must meet its funding commitments over the long term to sustainably support science. Uh, U.S. must build ethical and equitable collaborations with scientists around the world. And this effort requires careful attention from policymakers, especially for young and female scientists. And we heard that over and over again, especially in, in those parts of the world where you still have significant uh, 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 gender bias and you have uh, really poor participation in, in STEM by young girls and, and, and uh, young women. So that's really what I uh, was able to learn. And of course, when we uh, collaborate and we have retreats, we bring everybody and it's really, my lab is like the United Nations. So I'm going to end and thank you uh, for uh, paying attention. Dr. Olopade, thank you so much uh, for those incredible examples of, of successes um, in, in scientific partnerships. And I think that's a really good place to start um, in terms of both of you had mentioned um, really increasing uh, diversity, equity, inclusion um, into the STEM fields. And so already, I guess I, I uh, want to turn back to you in terms of um, expanding the domestic pipeline, like you mentioned, so critical for uh, the future of the STEM workforce in the United States. What can, you know, what levers can we pull um, both, you know, in Congress and the White House and, and other uh, sectors of the government to really make and ensure that that happens? I think a lot of attention has been paid to issues related to K-12 inequities. Uh, so I won't discuss those. What's been on my mind recently are the um, financial inequities. When you look at median family incomes, there are about 66,000, as I recall, for white families in the 50s for Latino families and in the 40s for African-American families. When you think about those numbers compared to now even public university costs, you see there's little opportunity for a large portion of our population to afford to go to college without uh, going into debt. And it's no surprise that 70% of our students who graduate, graduate with significant debt. Uh, if a young person then considers, do I want to go to graduate school in STEM or go for an MBA? Uh, you, if you're in debt, you have to take into account the fact that after two years of studying for an MBA, the average salary is $110,000. Whereas if you spend five or six years studying for a PhD, you can expect to start out at around 55 or $60,000. Uh, those are enormous uh, differences. And I think it, whereas we think of student debt as a personal problem, we have to now think of it as a public problem that's preventing us, our citizens, from participating in important national needs. And so I view those as primary factors in diversifying our STEM workforce, both by gender, by race, and by economic status. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Olapati. Yeah, yes, I, I, I mean, you're right on the money. Um, I think, you know, when I came to, from Nigeria to the US, I had gone to uh, medical school free and had no debt. And so it was easier for me to commit myself to doing research as an oncologist, uh, instead of really thinking about how I was going to pay my school loans. And uh, the brain circulation started because I thought I needed to give back to my community. And you will see a lot of students who will choose to go and have high income, uh, 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 higher income careers just because they can't afford the luxury of doing research. And in fact, the tradition of 
physician scientists has been those physicians who come from wealth. And, you know, my mentor, Dr. Rowley, you know, her husband told me that when he wanted to start his research career, when he was going to interview, they asked, do you have money? Because if you don't have money, you're not going to be able to sustain a career as a physician scientist. So I, I totally agree with Artie that we've got to think about how we encourage uh, diverse uh, uh, students to pursue STEM degrees and then to keep them uh, in, in research. Uh, the other thing is we also have to have in, in, you know, interesting questions for them to tackle. Because when I have students in my university who are, are looking for projects and we know that that's a challenge uh, in STEM, you know, the day, gone are the days where you want to mold everybody in your own image. And so the lab PI wants the student to come in and do what they, how they know how to do research. I think we need to be more open-minded. We need to support more women uh, to, you know, be able to take on rests. And, uh, and then, you know, students of color need to be able to express the questions that interest them and uh, for us to be able to support them and to resource those questions that they want to pursue. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, we, we've got a, um, a great question from, from the audience. And Dr. Olapade, I know you had mentioned at one point the private sector's role in encouraging uh, these types of international scientific collaborations. Um, and this, uh, th the question both um, covers both the private sector and also private donors. Is there a role, what's the role for the private sector um, in developing these types of partnerships and, and, and as well the private donors? Yeah, uh, well, I can tell you that most of the work that I, I, I've done in Nigeria has actually been funded by uh, either the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, which are donors in New York and uh, who raise money to support uh, the best uh, breast cancer scientists all over the world, or Susan G. Komen for the cure that's been uni un you know, un focused on ending and eradicating disparities in breast cancer. So a lot of foundations really focus on an issue and they go after it. However, my work in Nigeria was actually started with an idea grant from the Department of Defense, right? Mm -hmm. Women marched on Washington and they said, we want to have a plan, a war plan against breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I was not studying breast cancer and I had an idea. Can I go and think about, you know, the, you know, transcontinental research. And that idea has really blossomed into this longstanding collaboration. However, it's not sustainable if I have to write grants every you know, five years to sustain yeah. it. So we need private foundations, we need donors, we need supply chain to get to those uh, uh, scientists. And that was one of the things we heard that you know, scientists in, in Ghana would have to get their uh, uh, labs uh, uh, supply through the UK or through DHL bringing supplies from purchases in the US. Why can't we have direct supply to them in their lives in Nigeria? So then the cost becomes three times more expensive because of the third party payers. So I think uh, there's really a need for public private partnership to really you know, drive up the engine to uh, generate more scientific uh, collaborations with our partners. Can I add something? It, it, one thing that would really help are fellowships for uh, students from Africa to come to do graduate study in the United States. If you look at the history of US graduate schools, um, we played a big role in the development of Korea by developing graduate students and helping higher education advance in South Korea. Uh, we played similar roles in China and India the U.S. profits because some of the people stay here, but some of the people go home and advance science and technology in their own countries. So graduate fellowships for people from the emerging scientific partners would help enormously. 
And some of the foundations already have strong links in these countries. They could help to identify potential students. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. And I, I have a follow up question to that. If um, Dr. Lopate mentioned that she got government funding um, to do her research, are are there agencies within the government that are have these stories of success that really have the experience to um, facilitate these types of partnerships, either student exchanges or, or large scale facilities? Yeah. Well, I mean, so the Fogarty International Center at the NIH uh, really has funded a lot of uh, research. The NSF funds research. Uh, and uh, as part of our report, we did convening with funders, the Wellcome Trust. Uh, the, uh, in fact, to add to what Artie uh, was saying, when we were in uh, doing the convening with Korea, um, with South Korea, the scientists there were so engaged with what they could give back because of what America had done to help them build their research capacity. Mm -hmm. And they told us that they were actually going to be investing in, the, uh, in a global health initiative that will allow them to go to, I think it was Ethiopia uh, in Africa to help them build their capacity. And of mm -hmm. course, we know that with China and the Silk Road, uh, uh, Belt and Road uh, 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 initiative, he, they're investing in a lot of infrastructure. So while I I, we talked about you know, China's influence, uh, I, I see the uh, footprint all over Africa where uh, other countries are going in there and trying to see what they can do in partnership to build local capacity. But of course, you know, African countries also want to be able to do their own research. So the African Union and, uh, and governments are really wanting to do the research on their own terms so that we can decolonize uh, global health. But I think what they are really looking for is partnership. And that's what we heard all over uh, our convening. And uh, you know, America cannot do it alone. And that's why I think uh, you know, being the leader in terms of scientific productivity, and then knowing that other countries also want to engage our emerging science partners, of course, would like to continue to uh, trust that America will be there for them. Uh, because if America is not there, you know, there are other countries that are going to be uh, in these countries. Uh, and, and, I, and I just think it would be to our disadvantage if we don't uh, really engage in more meaningful way. Can one agency of which Peter and I were unaware is ONR Global. Mm -hmm. uh, ONR Global funds research around the world. Uh, it doesn't seem to get much attention, but we came to admire it very much. Mm, that's the Office of Naval Research? Yes. yes. Uh, which historically in the United States has been a leader in many different things. Remember, ONR got established almost and functioning right after the Second World War before NSF got going. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I want to stay on that for a second. Um, have there, is there a, so for our listeners that may not be aware of what a large scale, large science facility looks like, is there a model that you would look to in terms of building a, a large piece of infrastructure in, in Africa? Um, yeah, you, you, you know, the, the one that is most desired is a synchrotron radiation laboratory. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have several of them now. There are over 50 around the world. Uh, there is one in Amman, Jordan. But having one in Africa would be really advantageous. Uh, a synchrotron facility produces x-rays typically these days, about 10 million or 100 million times as intense as an X-ray tube. And they're used in experiments, everything from biology to uh, studying pollution to industrial processes, uh, plus all sorts of fundamental research. And even in anthropology and the classics, uh, mm -hmm. they play a role. 
so that is that is the uh, facility most desired in Africa, as far as we could determine, and and probably the one where the United States and Europe could help enormously. Uh, Europe played a significant role in the development of the facility in Jordan, as did UNESCO. Yeah, and it turns out that uh, one of the best uh, run facilities is actually in uh, uh, in Brazil, and we mm. had uh, a right. really remarkable uh, 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 visit with the scientists from uh, Sao Paulo, who actually talk about what how that had transformed the ecosystem of really strong scientific productivity in that region, uh, and uh, and could be a model to use for the African uh, large scale facility. Oh, and one more thing, it's a field where there's a tradition of the established labs helping other labs get going. So uh, it wouldn't be a stretch to help Africa. The other synchrotron facilities around the world would help. Yeah, I understand uh, the facility in Jordan was um, partially constructed at least from a um, hand-me-down accelerator from Germany, is that, is that right? That's correct. That's what got it started. Although in the end, uh, most of the components were, were built. And it's a remarkable facility. You know that Israel, Iran, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Greece, Turkey, uh, countries that don't normally collaborate scientifically, collaborated in the development and now in the use of sesame. It yeah. had, of course, brilliant leadership on the part of Khaled Tukan, uh, who is an American Academy foreign member. Well, that's, uh, yeah, it's a really incredible story. Um, and so, I, and I think that's a kind of a good place to kind of wrap up is that um, more than just economics or scientific discovery, there are other aspects of these large scale uh, partnerships that really uh, are, are just vital to, to the U.S. and other nations. And so I guess I want to ask each of you if you have a closing statement um, be before we sign off. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make one. Um, first of all, I've, I've dwelt on the value of these scientific interactions and collaborations to the United States. On the other hand, I didn't mention that uh, somewhere around 15 to 20% of the Chinese PhDs go back to China. They have helped bring hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And we should take enormous pride that we helped in that process. Yeah, and uh, yes, and I just want to echo what you have said by saying that after this pandemic, if we're really thinking about uh, justice, uh, inclusion, and equity, then I really think that we should rethink how we engage in biomedical research and really research using science and technology to promote equity, I think would really bring a lot of people in the global south out of poverty. And I think we can do it if we agree to do it in solidarity. Yeah, I think that's a great message to, to end on. Thank you. Thank you both so much for, for joining us today and taking the time uh, to, to do this webinar. Um, I guess we'll close just by saying um, thank you to all our audience members that stayed on and, and asked questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Bienenstock and Dr. Olapade for, for being with us today and answering questions and giving your, your insights on these issues. Um, and again, if the, uh, the report and the, the, the committee's uh, work at the American Academy is in the chat, um, and we are also happy offline to, to answer any, or I am uh, able to answer questions if you have follow-up uh, questions on these topics. So th thank you both so much and everyone have a really wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you for bye having us. Bye. Take care.